So welcome to our special forum, Physics Matter, to celebrate the 100 years of existence of the IUPA, the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics. So in anticipation of the Thanksgiving this Thursday, so we want to share particular thanks and more life present we are with our FIP audience in line with the celebration of the International Year of Basic Science and Sustainable Development. So last month, we have transcended borders and frontiers, thanks to the exciting colloquium, so by Kate Shaw, so listing the involvement of physics without frontier in developing communities, whom are celebrating actually right now the 10th years of existence in CS. So it's a coincidence, but this uh, month, we will celebrate also 100 years from the IUPA. So this month, we are recalling this uh, centenary uh, for, um, uh, symposium, sorry, which occurred at the ICTP last uh, summer in Trieste for that 100th anniversary. So this live forum so is organized by the Forum of International Physics, the FIP, at the American Physical Society, so the APS. And it celebrates physics for development and the SESAMI. So the member of our panel, so we have first so Andrea Lossi, who is the scientific director of the CESAMI. And for the FIP, so we have so Johnny Mella with us from the ICTP, who is the current chair. Alan may join a bit later, so from Los Alamos, to also represent so the Committee on the International and Scientific Affairs at the APS. And my name is Christine Dow, so I work at the European Spallation Source in Sweden, and I'm the chair elected of the FIP. So today, it's a real honor and a privilege for the Forum of International Physics to welcome our four special guests. So we have Michel Spiro with us, who is the president elected of the IUPAP since 2018. He chairs the steering committee of the International Years of Basic Science and Sustainable Development. So it's really a big honor on this year to be able to combine both. So he's uh, the former assistant scientific director of uh, the CNRS in France, the leader of the DAPNIA at CEA, and the former president of the CERN Conseil. So we have also with us Sylvina ponce Dowent from the ICTP president designated. So she's also the former chair of the working group of women in physics, and she's professor at the University of Buenos Aires and researcher at the Argentinian National Research Council. She's the senior associate also at the ICTP in Trieste. So our first and third guest, the third guest is Laura Green from uh, the APS. So she has been the former president of the APS and she is uh, so currently also working uh, so with uh, being vice president of the IUPA, former chair of the IUPA Commission on Structure and Dynamics of uh, Condensed Matter. And she is uh, the current chief scientist at the National High Magnetic Field Laboratories. Uh, in uh, Florida. So she was appointed to the President Council of Advisor in, of Science and Technology. And our last but not least uh, main guest uh, today, so will be Monica Pepe Altarelli, who is Hello. the IUPA uh, Vice President. She is a sound physicist uh, at uh, the LHCB collaboration, and she's the former LHCB deputy spokesperson. So she has been an uh, associate member delegate uh, to the EPS, so the European Physical Society Conseil. So it's a real honor to have uh, the four of you so today with us. And uh, so we will give, uh, so for the first introduction, so we will have uh, so the possibility for uh, the audience as well to ask questions. So we will mainly present first uh, some slides to introduce the topic. And following that, so we'll have possibility to as well listen to your question. So you have a question of answer. So um, a little uh, uh, audience where well, you could uh, write in advance as well those questions. Pick the language that you want. We can try maybe with uh, the representation for most of the continent, try to answer. And then we will have a possibility to give you as well the voice if you wish. So at the end of the presentation. So we will first then start by the presentation so of uh, Michel Spiro. Thank you, uh, Christine, for these kind words. And thank you for organizing this event, which shows the excellent uh, relationship between IUPAP 
and APS, which I hope we will keep in the future. So uh, to my present, I, I will share with you a presentation first on IUPAP and then on uh, IUIBSSD, the international year. So I share my screen. So IUPAP, uh, International Union of Pure and Applied Physics. Its mission is uh, uh, to assist the worldwide development of uh, physics and to, uh, and to foster international cooperation in physics and to help in the application of physics towards solving problems of concern to humanity. This is a mission which has, which is pre presently, uh, 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 but it was all, always uh, the mission of IUPAP. The, um, sorry, yeah, just, just the further IUPAP principles have been added at the occasion of the 100 years of IUPAP. They complete the um, uh, main statement that I read, foster openness and inclusiveness in physics, with a special attention to women in physics and to the developing world, promote free circulation of physicists, and now not only of physicists, but also of data, this is a question, ensure integrity and credibility, this is ramping up presently, you know, in this time, promote physics as a building block of innovation and multidisciplinary research, this is very important, especially for the sustainable development goals, promote physics as an essential tool for development and for sustainability. The IUPAP members uh, are uh, shown in, in this map. Uh, you see uh, in red founding members, in green uh, the uh, current members, but in blue the new members, uh, which is, uh, uh, became member in, in the last year. So you can see uh, Jordan, Egypt, uh, Bulgaria, and Uruguay. We are still lacking of African countries and also Central Asia. So the main activity, uh, I will not spend too much time because Silvina will go on, on that. The main activity for IUPAP is to sponsor a very large global conferences, about 50 conferences per year. The requirements are the scientific interest, obviously, but also the worldwide attendance with no a priori restriction or difficulty to attend. And Laura will uh, elaborate more on that, especially in, the, in this time. Also inclusiveness and diversity, as I said, uh, try to push to get more, more women and more people from developing countries. In these conferences, and more generally speaking, we are awarding the Early Career Scientific Prize. Uh, the award consi consists of a certificate medal and a monetary award. Uh, it is awarded generally uh, in, uh, in, during the conferences. I don't spend too much time on that because Silvina will cover that. We were very active on the, the gender gap project, how to measure it, how to reduce it which is now been transformed into a standing committee on gender equality in sciences, where IUPAP plays a, an important role together with other unions. We are also a strong actor of the LAM project, Light Sources for Africa, the Americas, Asia, and Middle East project. We were a supporter of SESAME, and we would like to see the light source in Africa, the light source in Latin America, uh, in Asia. We have a newsletter, and we, are, uh, we, we were the uh, uh, initiator of the uh, International Year of Basic Sciences for Sustainable Development. Many unions and organizations joined the steer steering committee. Uh, you can see the logo here, about 50 uh, unions and, and, uh, and organizations. And we have 100 academies worldwide uh, constituting, constituting the uh, International Advisory Committee. And uh, we have a high patronage committee with 31 now, 31 Nobel laureates or field medalists. So I will spend some time on the International Year of Basic Sciences for Sustainable Development, uh, because this will not co be covered by the other sp uh, speakers, Silvina, Laura, and Monica. 
So first, uh, I want to show you, to, to give you a little bit of the rationale behind uh, this uh, international year. And uh, this cannot be better shown than uh, with uh, this uh, one minute presentation video made by CERN. Uh, some people already saw, saw it, but I cannot resist to show it again. Uh, my grand niece, uh, Eloise Goldberg, starring in it, she is uh, 13 years old. So let's uh, show this the video. Curiosity about the world around us is what makes us human. This desire to make sense of the world is the driving force behind fundamental science. Stirred by this curiosity, each new generation of scientists adds to the pool of knowledge built up by previous generations. We are at a crucial time for the future of our planet. Now, more than ever, it is imperative to use this pool of knowledge to help solve the global problems we face and pave the way for a more sustainable development. And we must not stop being curious. Future generations will be inspired by the knowledge we contribute today, equipping them with the powerful tools they need to build a better world. I hope you enjoyed. We have it in French also and in Chinese. Uh, so to be more concrete, some examples uh, related to what was uh, uh, advertised in this video. Vaccines and treatments against COVID-19 are full of basic biology. The web was born at CERN from the needs of fundamental science. Google research engine comes from a brilliant mathematical ID. Artificial intelligence relies on statistical methods. Cellular phones are full of transistors, integrated circuits. GPS relies on Einstein's theory of relativity and on quantum atomic clocks. The Genome Project has opened the way to gene therapies. PET scan and MRI are based on antimatter imaging. Generation and, anti and storage of renewable energy depends on advances in physics, chemistry, and material science. Reduction in pollution and green chemistry rely on basic advances in chemistry. The second quantum resolution is having now applications. So uh, I don't want to uh, recall you the, the history of uh, which came, which which was uh, at the uh, origin of this international year. Just to tell you that uh, it was a five-year story, and finally we got the proclamation by the by consensus by the United Nations General Assembly only on December second, twenty twenty-one, for an international year in twenty twenty-two. So this is why uh, the opening ceremony occurred only on uh, July 8th at uh, UNESCO headquarters due to the late pro proclamation. It was a wonderful high level representative, large attendance and large audience ceremony. Many ministers, uh, many Nobel laureates, many distinguished scientists, many early career scientists, many uh, scientists from the developing world, uh, from the developing world, uh, uh, many, um, institutions represented there, the Club of Rome, and so on. The closing ceremony is expected to be at CERN in Geneva on October 6, 2023, which means that the international year will span over two years, 2022 and 2023. There are flagship events. I will report in the next slides on the, uh, the outcome of the first three flagship events. There are global events, regional events, national, local events in developed and in developing countries. I consider this webinar as part as one of the events of the international year. So uh, outcome of the uh, opening ceremony uh, with uh, two, one or two slides, uh, at least to my mind, this is uh, what uh, uh, I want to advertise. Uh, basic sciences are curiosity and inquiry driven. They are the foundations of education and the sources of discoveries which turn into applications. They can then serve an inclusive sustainable development, improving global equity and well being together with a healthy and lively planet. All together, education, discoveries, applications, and inclusive sustainable development can boost collaborative and open basic sciences. This is a virtuous circle that we want to promote during the International Year of Basic Sciences for sustainable development and after. To achieve this goal, we shall need you, teachers, scientists, 
the private sector, decision makers, and society at large to share this vision and act accordingly. Also, uh, what is clear is that uh, we are facing uh, global challenges, which might look a little bit uh, frightening, but we can see that in, a, in another way. Global challenges uh, approaches, which have to be done uh, from a component to system approach, from local to global approach, from short, short term to long term approach, involving open science and the society at large, are a unique opportunity to cooperate and maybe build a better world. Following further the current international mobilization, laws and treaties should be enacted toward these goals based on a dialogue between all stakeholders, including scientists. I will elaborate more in the outcome of the third event. Second event in Vietnam, Rencontre du Vietnam, uh, the director is Tran Tan Van, that many people know. It was uh, focused on science, ethics, and human development. So in one slide, the outcome, scientific knowledge, uh, technology, and innovation shape our lives, our imagination, our hopes, our fears. But beyond, it is a common universal, universal heritage. Business, as usual, is no more an option, even for scientists. Every scientist, through his or her institution, especially when supported by public funds, and even if his research is curiosity and inquiry driven, basic sciences, each scientist must try to best connect to the society and should have in mind how his or her activity and findings could impact the world. So this is the responsibility of scientists and might be of interest for contributing to make it better and not worse. However, in return, Scientists must be given the necessary funding and freedom and the right to collaborate with the other scientists they would like to collaborate in their field to conduct their research and be listened to at all levels of decision making, decision making and inspire that way the decision makers and the society at large. It is a balancing act, responsibility of the scientists versus trust of the society to ensure societies trust the scientists and the knowledge they provide. Third event in a Belgrade, uh, Belgrade conference, uh, a world conference on basic sciences for uh, development. Uh, so this is a plead for uh, sustainability science. Sustainability science, this is emerging now. Sustainability science education of young people should be implemented in addition to the standard STEM education. Sustainability science must be uh, multidisciplinary, integrative, collaborative, co-constructed, and open. Open uh, publishing, open data, open software, and even open hardware. Uh, it goes, this sustainability science goes from very basic understanding what, me what means an habitable planet, uh, modelizing the, uh, the, the entire planet uh, system uh, up to the uh, 17 interconnected uh, sustainable development goals, which I can summarize by reduce poverty, improve uh, well being beyond just swimming, target global equity, and a lively and healthy planet. Circular economy fueled by decarbonated energy could be the application target of sustainability science with a lot of innovations and new practices needed. And now come uh, what might be new. It could benefit for their organization, the sustainability science, from models of organization in big basic sciences and from the IPCC and IPBES, so uh, Intergovernmental Panel, Panel for Climate Change, and the same for uh, biodiversity and environment. Uh, of interaction between scientists and decision makers. A decade of actions might be necessary to implement that. And for instance, uh, the idea was pushed forward of a, a treaty international organization for sustainability science. Sustainability uh, is a good, is a global uh, challenge. Uh, a glo world global response is needed. 
One possibility is the creation of a treaty inter intergovernmental organization for sustainability science, inspired from big basic sciences models of organization. For example, the visionary CERN model for particle physics after the Second World War, and we are a little bit in similar condition now. Uh, so inclusive, collaborative, open, with a mission to conduct, to coordinate, to capitalize all initi initiatives in that domain, in connection with all researchers of the domain, but also with the private sector and with the society at large in the spirit of co-construction, especially with the so societies uh, worldwide. To promote uh, research, innovation, education, and training in that domain, to establish roadmap for sustainability science and for sustainability in general, in close connection with the governments following a reinforced model of IPCC and IPBES. The key big mutualized infrastructure of this organization could be a co-constructed virtual twin model uh, of the Earth, including the activities on Earth. So what are the prospects, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the possible resulting action, uh, actions of this international year? Implementation of open access publishing for all basic sciences papers and more generally of open data and open software, and maybe open hardware. Open science is more important than ever to go faster, to maintain a global approach to science. Uh, basic sciences can be the advanced front in open science. It might be the only way to collaborate worldwide now. Uh, promote equity, uh, diversity, and inclusion into collaboration in basic sciences. Promote training and education to basic and sustainability sciences in developing countries. Connect scientists to the actors of sustainable development. And maybe uh, obtain a decade of sciences for sustainable development using lessons for the models of mobilization of scientists in basic sciences, CERN, IPCC, IP. Yes. And this is the last slide. We count on all of you for, for all that. And uh, I, I take the famous formula. Yes, uh, we can. Thank you uh, very much for this, uh, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, we can. Indeed, it's not only American, so it's uh, international. It was an excellent uh, presentation and summary of the capacity so for the IUPA, but as well in complete line uh, with this international year of uh, basic science and sustainable development. So do we have maybe a few questions from the audience? We have heard about indeed as well this freedom and uh, the societal responsibility of science. And I think it's uh, an important message there as well. And uh, the role of the government. And as well, if you have any advice, uh, for instance, for the, the youngest uh, uh, early career scientists as well that want to participate, so would you ask them uh, what could they do, for instance, with uh, the IUPAP? Are there specific roles, for instance, where they could engage right away? Yes. Uh, for instance, uh, we recently admitted the International Association of Physics Students as a, a, an affiliated uh, commission of IUPAP. So this has a rejuvenated uh, uh, IUPAP, and they are very active, uh, both uh, to, to help us, but also to give ideas on how we could be uh, more uh, active in connecting physics and the industry, which uh, so far is a, a bit a weak point of IUPAP. And with their help, and with a new working group on the physics and industry, we hope to develop a new sector of innovation where young people can certainly have their uh, strong uh, role to play, especially uh, we, with what I mentioned, innovation for sustainable development, which is in front of us uh, and has, has to be accompanied with the young people. That's excellent. That's, I think, the important part, looking at the evolution as well for the sustainability um, and using the, the modern uh, methodology as well. Thank you so much. So we'll come back maybe and certainly for, for more questions a bit later, but maybe before, so we have uh, Sylvina who could as well elaborate a bit more on those different principles from the IU Papa. So you want me to, to talk before my, I mean, to make my presentation or to- If, if you could maybe start by your presentation and that way we okay, could- Okay, so uh, let, me, let me share my screen then. 
And again, everyone is welcome to write any question and raise hand. Okay. The presentation works. So, okay, so thank you for the invitation. Um, so I'm going to a little bit overlap with what Michelle has said and said some things new. So I'm going to start a little bit with the history of IUPAP. So most of these international unions were created at the beginning of the 20th century, immediately after the creation of the International Research Council, which was created in 1919 to coordinate international efforts in the different branches of science and to be able to speak with policymakers, basically. And so um, IUPAP was created in 1922 with 30 country members. So always membership to IUPAP until recently has been through country representations or what we call territories now. This, this is the list of the 13 initial countries. And the first president was William Henry Bragg. And in 1923, IUPAP had its first general assembly on already with new members. And then a, well, since I am from Latin America, to me it's important to note when Latin American countries joined uh, UPAP and Mexico joined pretty early in 1925. So the second president was Robert Millikan. And then in the thirties and through the second world war, it was very turbulent years. And, but the, uh, the person who was in charge, the president managed to keep the union working to some extent. And so in the, uh, at the end of the, after World War II and in the, at the beginning of the fifties, IUPAP was sort of restructured and started to focus on the main activities that have been its main activities for many years after that. As I, I mentioned here in 1931, they were discussing units and nomenclature and that's one of the activities that IUPAP is still engaged with. But then in the 50s, they started to sponsor these international conferences. And also it started to be organized in commissions by subdiscipline of, a, of physics. And that's when Brazil and Argentina joined the union. And so these are at the core of IUPAP's activities, conferences, units, and commissions by subfields. And, but now, well, we have a much wider membership and we have 60, over 60 territorial members. And also we approved a new type of membership, which is corporate members, and is to be able to reach out to physicists and people interested in physics that work outside academia and also to liaise with, well, with companies and with large research organizations. And we are also discussing the possibility of creating a new type of membership for small physics communities in developing countries, which we would call some developing a membership or something like that. And so because physics for development is one of the, uh, of the aims of the union. And we have also a category of what we call official observers. They are mostly physical societies and regional physics, national or regional physical societies that come to our assembly, don't have voting rights, but can participate in some of the uh, activities where we, we make decisions like the assembly or the meetings of our executive committee. And because in particular, all these territorial members, they are represented at the General Assembly through what is called a liaison committee. And in some countries, this is not the physical societies, but the National Academies of Sciences, for example, in the US, that's the liaison committee. And territorial members are those that have voting rights. So are those that participate in the main decisions that we make in all the decisions, I would say. So now we are starting a new century with a renovated set of aims. In particular, the kind of themes that we want to promote are diversity. It's not that we started now, but we've been doing that for quite a while with, for 
different lengths of time actually, but uh, we want to put strengthen those activities. One is diversity and inclusion, physics for development, physics for sustainability, that's like the newest, I would say, interdisciplinary kind of projects, physics education, and also science policy and diplomacy, which I guess Laura is going to discuss. And then we also want to increase the interaction with the communities, in particular with these national physical societies in territorial members that are represented by other liaison committees, but also with a early career scientists, early career physicists and physics students. Michelle has already mentioned that about the physics, this uh, association of physics students, also physics outside academia and these regional physics communities. And we want to expand our actions, increase our visibility, carry out more outreach projects and maybe think of, of new projects, but without disregarding our traditional activities. So we are sort of a, we are a hub, a hub I say, I, I view IUPAP as a hub of the large network of physics communities. And so as, an, as this hub, what we try to do is to help build communities, in particular in developing countries or communities of users of certain facilities, exchange useful information, promote good practices, nurture collaborations and engage communities to propagate our actions and views. And then we also sponsor some activities in particular conferences and awards and that for them, we can impose some restrictions, some conditions. And what we try to do is to impose those conditions that we feel reflect our view, our values, our commitments, in particular, our compromise to guarantee that the practice of physics is free of any sort of discriminations and that knowledge is openly shared. And we also have a travel grant program for women from developing countries to be able to attend conferences or schools or workshops outside their home institutions and participate in specific projects. In particular, now there is one that is LAMP that Michelle mentioned, but we had a strong participation in another project before that I'm going to mention. So regarding early career physicists and physics students, we have a this set of awards for early career physicists. They, we, have, we are organized in commissions by subfield, so each commission has, gives one award per year. And, and so we try to visibilize what they are doing and try to engage them. We understand that at early career stages, people are more focused into developing their own careers, but they are always welcome to participate in our working groups and also in our commissions um, and then we recognize the International Association of Physics Students as an affiliated commission of IUPAP. So a, the chair of that commission participates in our assemblies with one vote, and then also they participate of our meetings of the executive committee and the uh, com chairs of commissions meetings. And then physics education, we have a commission on physics education that has been working for many years now. And they organize an international conference regularly and also they issue a newsletter. They work mostly on, a, it's, they do research on physics education and mostly on college or university level education. But they've been also producing some material that can be useful for teachers of a secondary school or well, when, wherever, physics is taught, but be, before university. And then inclusion and diversity, I, I would say this is a story of success of IUPAP. It created the Women in Physics Working Group in 1999. This is a visit to the White House of the first working group. And this led to the establishment of a network. It's also a hub of another network of women in physics working groups across the world in many more countries than members of IUPAP and organizes an international conference once every three years where people share their experience and they are very, very dynamic and very inspirational. 
And this is the last in-person conference, international conference on women in physics that we had in the UK. And then the last conference was virtual, organized from Australia last year. And from these conferences, uh, there is at the end an assembly that discusses possible resolutions to be taken by the General Assembly of IUPAP. And these resolutions have helped reshape IUPAP. In particular, I was chair of this working group and my relation with IUPAP started through the working group. Then we have this travel grant program that I mentioned. And we recently approved a charter on gender inclusion and diversity in physics that we called Waterloo Charter. And we also have a vice president with gender champion duties that serves as a link between the working group and the executive committee of IUPAP. We have different sets of rules for our conferences so that to be able to be sponsored, you need to have at least 10% of women among members of the committees plenary speakers. We also request that uh, organizers su submit statistics on participation and the target is to go beyond, to reach 20% and of course increase eventually beyond 20%. Also, we have some rules for the internal composition of IUPAP regarding gender diversity. So far it has been binary, but we are discussing how to go beyond these women, men, uh, inclusion and, and also to increase in diversity in multi in a multi-dimensional way. And also we have a rule on the diversity of candidates for awards. And we were key participants of this interdisciplinary project that was originally funded by the International Science Council. It was carried out with 10 and other international partners. It had three tasks and IUPAP was in charge of the global survey of scientists that was run by the AIP Statistical Research Center in very much the same way they had done with the physics global survey we had in 2009, 2010. This time it was 34,000 people who answered and the results of the survey and of the project, they are in this a final report, these nice figures, pictures, cartoons are from that report and is available on the website that is over here. And then it, this activity led, led to the creation of the Standing Committee on Gender Equality in Science. And this activity also had a huge impact in many regions of the world, particularly in Latin America, where we produced a book that you can, it's mostly in Spanish though, uh, that is available also in our website. And we also started a new persona, I would say, that we call We Trust, We Trust Ciencia. We Trust is a word in a native uh, indigenous language of Latin America. And then, well, Physics for Development, we have a commission for that. And they give an award for achievements in Physics for Development. They also uh, analyze the requests of sponsorship for a special line of funding of conferences that we have, which we call type D conferences that are to be held in developing countries. And it is also part IUPAP of this LAM project, which is a project to build community of users of light sources in the developing world mostly. And then these are, were two very interdisciplinary projects and the most urgent problems that humanity faces now, they need an interdisciplinary approach. So we expect to be able to liaise with other unions in particular, to work on things related to sustainable development and climate change. And we recently created this working group on physics and the green economy. And we hope this will be the seed of this interdisciplinary collaboration in the future. So with this, I will end and be open to questions. Thank you. Very good, very good. So we have now a, a good complementary as well from the historical point of view. And I think it was uh, important as well to mention how the physical society was used as well as a, an image for the standardization of a lot of the norms. So I like this aspect as well. And it recalls as well, uh, the indeed with uh, Europe as well. So I remember from one of the first presentation we had with uh, Petra Rodolphe, 
that was uh, presenting as well all the different aspects of standard. So I invite you as well to look back in our physics matter from uh, the very beginning when Luisa Cifarelli was uh, presenting all of that. So it, it really resonates, I think, with many aspects. So do we have uh, more questions? We have uh, a comment already there. So, and I think it could be a way to develop as well a question on that. So from uh, Mebale, so who were exciting to be uh, participating to this um, special event, so the 100th anniversary of the IUPA. And she's a physicist uh, and a mathematician teachers at the Abu Dhabi in Ethiopia and wishing uh, an happy birthday. So it's really nice. And thank you, Laura, for your answer. So it's uh, also recalling, as you were showing, Michelle, the possibility potentially as well to add uh, uh, Ethiopia as well in the map of the IUPAP uh, by furthering further collaboration. And Sylvana, you were showing how with uh, the um, high school and maybe up to elementary school, maybe to try to find materials as well, exchange. So with Africa would be the perfect way. So yeah, maybe yeah. Sometimes the problem with a material for a secondary school is language, because I mean, for science and university, you can share it in English, but then for other levels of education, usually it's in the language of the country. But at English speaking countries, they could, I guess, take some examples from what the, uh, the Commission on Physics Education has been compiling. So that's it. An interesting thing. I, I understand that we're planning to translate, but I don't know how far they have gone with that. Maybe we could get some sponsor by Google and have those automatic translations. Oh, that, that would be no? great. Yeah, yeah. Then I, I like very much the uh, outreach activities with secondary students, but those usually are, I usually organize from my physics department in Argentina, but Right now we are starting one in collaboration with people from Taiwan and also the IEEE Magnetic Society, uh, measuring the uh, geomagnetic field uh, on occasion of the International Year of Basic Sciences for Sustainable Development and also the 300th anniversary of the first measurement of the declination of the magnetic field. And so hopefully we will start in Argentina to measure next year, but in Taiwan they've already started and we are trying to collaborate on that and have students engaged into that. So it could be interesting to engage in different continents and make yes, those that's the idea. worldwide. That's the idea. We With started a, uh, Taiwan and Argentina because we are kind of on the antipodes of the yeah. of the earth, and and so we have instructions in English and in Spanish actually now, for sure. <laughs> So you need then Scandinavia as well and Africa. Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> a good compliment. So thanks, uh, thanks a lot. So maybe in the in the sake of time, we'll come back to more questions after that, and we'll have Laura to speak. Uh, so from her political or, or more American side as well. Yeah, thank you very much, for Christina. Um, these webinars that you've been sponsoring have been really terrific. I've attended most of them, if not all of them. And uh, thank you for your introductions. And uh, Sylvina and Michelle, your hard acts to follow. Uh, my talk will be less content and more trying to be provocative because that's what I like to do. So I'll start out with talking about uh, US centric, because this is American Physical Society, about what I've learned about uh, science advising and science advocating in the United States and the changing landscape of science diplomacy. And like I said, I'm at the National High Magnet Field Laboratory in Florida State University and a vice president of IUPAP and a PCAST member. So science advising, this is the important slide for this. Right now is when uh, it, it's monitored and run by the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, but different groups support these things. And uh, the American Physical Society, I think has gone up to four, uh, four, four uh, fellows that go onto the Hill to advise branches of government. And what we used to do is only go, so, and go down to the bottom there, the middle, there's three branches of government of the United States. There's the legislative, executive, and the judicial branch. They're supposed to be um, separate and having checks and balances on each other, but we're finding out that we really do need advice. And we've sent fellows 
both the legislative branch and the executive branch. And it's being st started now that we're going to send fellows to the judicial branch. And these are young people that learn to uh, get information together and advise people in their offices, whether they're a legislature in the, in the executive branch, like the president's office or the Department of Energy, National Science Foundation or in the executive office or in the judicial branch. Now, um, what I want to say at the bottom there is what I, I was pretty successful at this when I was APS president. I was on the Hill for a few years doing a lot of this. And everybody can reach out to the to the governments. But what I want to stress, and these four bullet points are things I want to stress. And when you go into an office, and you probably will not be talking to you know, the director of NSF or the senator or the congressperson, you will be talking to the aides. And the aides are really very important to talk to because they, they're what makes things happen. And when you go, you need to be prepared. And these are the four things that you need to be prepared with. The first thing is that, yes, it's true, uh, for uh, one of our senators or congresspeople, to be successful, they have to be elected again. And what is more and more true is that when you advocate for science policy, you need to understand what their constituents want. So, and so they'll be electable. So if you're going into a small uh, group, a small representative group in Southern California, you probably don't wanna promote the gloriousness of LIGO or why we should join CERN. What you want to do is show why agriculture, sci scientific studies in agriculture has helped agriculture succeed in their district. Uh, so you want to keep that in mind. Uh, the second thing is economics. Uh, what is economic sustainability? How will you grow jobs? That's something that PCAST is worrying about. So when I lived in Illinois, it was we did discuss how Argonne and Fermi Lab did create jobs. And here in uh, Florida, how the Magnet Lab has tremendous economic uh, sustainability and growth in the Northern Florida region and does create jobs. So keep those in mind. Just going on and saying, oh, isn't science wonderful is not going to help. Um, I can also supply you with, and a lot of this is on the APS website as far as the economics go, that in developed countries, the GDP and support of science and technology track each other. The more money that's put into science and technology, the more of the uh, more of the general economic growth of that country. The third thing is very, very, very important. You have to remain staunchly non-political. Whether you agree with the candidate, whether you agree with their politics or not should be completely left outside the door. I was in offices across all different aisles and I still talk with people all across different aisles because one thing we could agree on is science and technology is good for the United States. And so we need to keep that in mind and do not, whether you're doing human rights, science diplomacy or advocating for science, you need to remain staunchly nonpartisan and nonpolitical. And the other thing that's becoming more and more important is you can point out the global competition. You can point out, and, and you know that now, um, that one, one of the few things that unifies our Congress is you know, we don't want to be, we don't want to lose our global competitive advantage in the United States. Then I'm just going to shout out a little bit for the APS Office of Government Affairs. I'm not going to go, I'm, I'm hoping this talk will be short, but it's been extremely successful. That person over here, I think that's Sleek. <laughs> He's been running that. He's now at a higher level um, at, at the American Physical Society. But they have really done a lot of research. And if you want to help in science funding, educational funding, technology funding, they can help, uh, help give you what you need to go to the Hill and talk to people. And here's just some ex examples. You know, they had over 5,000 advocates for the Chips Plus Science Act that was just signed into law. <clears throat> and by the way, one of the things that that was signed into law was something I'll mention when I talk about PCAS is there's $20 billion that needs to be appropriated that will go into regional science hubs in the United States. There are also advocates on methane emissions. There was a lot, there were studies on that. 
um, immigration policy. As we all know, the United States has always made its science successful by getting people in from other countries and educating them and some stay and some leave. And the immigration policies are becoming more and more difficult to have this international scientific collaboration, which is so needed on our planet. And then of course, we work very hard on the liquid helium crisis, which is getting a little bit better, but these are just some of the directions that we go. Mo moving on to my work uh, directly advising po POTUS, which is President Joe Biden. The council consists of about 30 scientists, engineers, and social sciences, and economists. And it's diverse in every aspect, whether gender, background, uh, sexual orientation. And we, we already know that diversity in science is required for science to be successful. We, uh, and there's many, many uh, aspects of that. Um, so um, we focus on what POTUS is interested in. And he requests general strategies and specific um, actions and new structures to address, address questions across our nation. There are working groups and there are exploratory groups, and we're working on some of those right now. And I just wanted to bring this up, what President Biden stated here. He doesn't just want to know how do we prepare from the, for the next pandemic. His question was, what have we learned from the pandemic about what is possible, what ought to be possible to address the widest range of needs related to our public health. In other words, he's interested in accessibility as, as it happens in the United States, survival, health, all those things depend more on zip code than anything else. So this president is very interested in that. Um, another thing is uh, you know, competition with China. And this number four is how can we guarantee that the fruits of science and technology are fully sh shared across America and among all other Americans? What that means is that about 90% uh, of the tech jobs in the United States are in about 10% of the cities at the coast. So what the Chips and Science Act is doing is trying to promote different technical hubs all over the United States. They don't have to be as large as these other giant tech hubs, but we're going to have to be training Americans who mostly get their, are, are, get their income by digging and drilling. And we have to be educating humans and creating jobs in the United States that go across the technical se sectors. And, uh, and then the long-term health of science and technology. And so these are big questions. Now I'm going to get a little more um, I'm going to do this because I'm going to be reading something. Um, so, so that was the science diplomacy aspect of that. I'm sorry, that was the science advising aspect. And what we have here is a letter that we request uh, Russian scientists to sign if they want to come to an uh, IUPAP sponsored or endorsed conference. This was a very difficult conclusion to come through, come to. And I'm going to give you some background, but last summer at the General Assembly, this was passed by this was passed by the General Assembly, including the Russian delegation. And what it says is that if you want to attend an IUPAP sponsored or endorsed conference, and you're from Russia, you need to sign that your affiliation is IUPAP, and you're not presently involved in a hot war. Okay. Now, this is dangerous, it's, it's difficult, and not all Russians will be able to sign this, but it's a step forward. And what I'm going to do is give a little bit, I have a few minutes of time to talk about what how science diplomacy has changed. And so this is part of a speech that I gave. And, and, and I started out by saying that, well, science diplomacy is a changing landscape now. Since the invasion of Ukraine, CERN has published fewer scientific papers in the first two months of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. There were no CERN publications. Why? Because the German and the Polish physicists refused to co-author papers. Okay, that's something different. Um, even historical, historically neutral Switzerland has sanctioned Russia. Um, now, we, uh, we agree that the pursuit of science must remain a global endeavor to ensure broad access to large scale facilities, okay, and diverse participation. 
and the continued ability to build constructive international partnerships. We heard of some of those here, whether it's LAMP or whatever, um, Sesame, but science diplomacy has changed since the 20th century. And in, how do we address these new challenges? And this is what IUPAP did with this letter. So what is science diplomacy? Science diplomacy compri was comprised traditionally, it was defined as the communication, not war among states. And it goes back into the 14th century BCI in something called the Armana letters in, the eight, in, uh, in early Egypt. So in Canaan during the fourth, 14th century BCE, um, where they said, let's try to discuss things without fighting and there were things written up. Okay, so that's the whole history of diplomacy. But then the new diplomacy happened in the 20th century that began with not just heads of states and diplomats, but citizens would interact with each other across borders and boundaries to try to just establish communication, which helps in averting wars. A subset of the new diplomacy is science diplomacy, which is the use of scientific collaborations among nations to address common problems and to build constructive international partnerships. Now, what's changed here? Many of us are familiar with the importance of science diplomacy in the 1950s and 60s. In the midst of the Cold War between the US and the Soviet Union, when both nations were heavily armed, much more than they were today with nuclear weapons. The U.S. and the Soviet physicists were not intimidated by the truly frightening contentiousness between the countries and continued and they continued reciprocal visits. I want to just put in a, a sidebar for diversity. There, are, I work in correlated electron physics or high temperature superconductors or many body problem. There are dozens and dozens of those problems that exist, and in the 1950s. We, it is generally accepted that it was these people with the diverse background of the Soviets and the Americans, these white guys working together, helped solve one of the few solved problems in this, which is the BCS theory of superconductivity. So that's another proof why we need diversity. But, but back, back to science diplomacy. Um, uh, we, I wrote a back page with, um, with Warren Pickett when the, um, the Americans refused to let a few of us visit Iran. We were invited by Mohammed Akhavan in a standard conference that we go to all over the world. And we had accepted that we're not gonna, I, I even said, I won't bring my cell phone and I won't check my email, everything is open source, but they still stopped us. And that was bad for science diplomacy because so many of these Iranian students are, are so isolated and it would be good for them to just talk about physics and get to know people. Um, and then for decades, one of my fundamental values has always been that we must for, for science and for humanity, we must maintain the transparency. Oh, I'm sorry, that's, that's gonna be spam. The, the importance um, of, of, um, of uh, the transparency of people and ideas across border and boundaries. That's good for science, scientists, and promotion of diplomatic and constructive communication among nations, especially contentious ones. And on a global scale, it seemed, I repeat, it seemed that our, our diplomacy was working. There were better interactions between people. Our democracy was increasing. Our, our, our getting along was increasing. International collaboration was getting better and better and better. But all of a sudden things are changing, whether it's in the US or another country. And one thing that happened, I was at a conference and I was giving a talk on science diplomacy. And my talk on science diplomacy was the day after Mikhail Gorbachev died. He was the leader of the Soviet Union from 1985 to 1981. He had two important aspects, perestroika and glasnost. Glasnost was an openness, allowing freer and freer scientific exchanges and improved human rights, even allowing religious minorities to leave, including 3 million Soviet Jews. He didn't have anything special for the Jews. He was just wanting to do this glasnost. And his policy now, is credited as one of the several main reasons of the fall of the USSR. 
That explained that propaganda and repression that he abhorred was what kept the Soviet Union together. But then in 2005, President, the Russian President Vladimir Putin made the statement that the collapse of the Soviet empire was, quote, the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. And we know what's going on in the Ukraine today. So my question, which is, which is very, very provocative is, has science diplomacy changed? Are we better off in the long run to make it a little bit more difficult the, you know, the Russian scientists, we don't want to make them suffer anymore. And they're going to jail. And, and in, a, in the in SIFS, the Committee on the International Freedom of Scientists, which is an APS committee that I'm on, we keep an eye on them. But in the long run, is it time to call this out and maybe do make it difficult, like this IUPAP letter, so in the long run, we can have better, uh, better interaction between scientists on the global scale? Um, so that's my provocative speech. <laughs> so, and I'll stop sharing. So thanks a lot, Laura. It's important to have provocative question like that. So, and, and maybe for a partial answer, I would like to call for Petra Rudolf, whom I just invited, because one of the potential answers as well could be through PhD students across as well, the different countries. And, and the proposal that you had, I think was excellent. So if you want to maybe elaborate a bit Petra on that. So thank you to be Thank you us. very much for allowing me in and <clears throat> to share my thoughts. Well, first of all, happy birthday to IOPAP from the 130,000 uh, physicists in Europe that the U European Physical Society represents. What I would like to propose to UPAP is to make to member, society, member uh, countries worldwide uh, known that in Europe we have something which is called PhD projects in co to tell, which means that you uh, do your PhD project at your home university, but co supervised by somebody in Europe. And you also spend some time in Europe and at the end of the run, you get a PhD uh, degree, which is recognized by the two institutions, by your uh, home institution and by the European University uh, that was involved in your uh, supervision. And I think that if we promote this kind of uh, uh, co to tell PhD projects that gives extraordinary possibilities for young scientists to experiment and to uh, uh, experience research environments all over the world. And I would be very happy if uh, uh, similar activities would develop also between other countries, uh, not only between European countries and uh, others, but if, uh, for example, I know that in the United States, it's not very well, uh, very often done, if also American universities would open up more to this concept, and I think UPUP could play a role in that. Thank you, Petra. Uh, this is Michel Spiro. We are discussing that in IUPAP to generalize that uh, globally. I think it could be uh, an avenue for IUPAP uh, uh, using your experience uh, at EPS. Thank you very much for this proposal. Yeah, thank I, you. I, I also want to thank you. We've been trying to, Florida State University is trying to twin with Ukrainian universities and, and seeing best practices. I chair that task force. And the, the barriers in the United States are huge to do anything like that, even sharing IT. So what we are doing is we're, we're pairing with a UK university and another university to try to help funnel that over because as you know, the US has some big barriers to those kind of collaborations, unfortunately. But I, I think we can learn from you and find better, best practices that we might be able to apply. Canada does it already. So there are many Canadian uh, universities who participate in these projects as well. Yeah, it's easier in Canada than the US right now too, so. Uh, so we're, we're, we'll keep trying. <laughs> It's certainly, I mean, for the, the, the student and as well for the full community, it's, it's essential to have this international capacity as well. And, and indeed, you mentioned as well, and we have Joe, so maybe Joe, it's related to that, with the ICTP to go even broader with the Middle East and 
We know, like for instance, with uh, possibility from Iranian student as well to be able to visit and use different facilities like the Max 4 that we have here. So maybe, I don't know, Joe, is it uh, what you wanted to mention? Or... Well, <clears throat> yeah, thanks. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, yeah, I, uh, it I had a different question, but I just wanted to make that point that actually we have a, uh, a nice collaboration with APS and EPS, uh, really initiated by Petra Rudolph. I have to give all the credit to her. And uh, we have a young Iranian uh, scientist, a young woman, uh, at Max4, and, and not only did she take two months there at our expense, but uh, Max4 extended her. So uh, at any rate, it's, uh, it's working out very well. Uh, also, st uh, sandwich programs, uh, IAEA started this uh, many years ago with Ana Maria Cheto uh, from Mexico, who was the DDG of uh, technical cooperation at IAEA. And uh, so we've been doing that uh, with IAEA at ICDP for many years, and it's a great program. I've had all my students, of course, have been step students. Um, yeah, so it worked, works out very well. Uh, I had actually a, a very specific, well, maybe it's not a specific question. Uh, it's a question to, uh, to Laura and also uh, to, to everybody from IUPAP. And it, uh, Laura, you mentioned that uh, maybe you would need some uh, 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 young intern, not interns, but uh, representatives at the judicial branch. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we've seen lately that, uh, especially with Chinese scientists getting in trouble in the United States and also their collaborators, there's, there's something that seems to be new, but maybe you can, you can tell me differently. And that's that uh, I know if I do classified military research, I'm going to go to jail <laughs> with, with, if I start collaborating with uh, Chinese, Russians, or anybody else uh, that's not U.S. and not authorized. But there seems to be a big gray area of uh, research maybe involving semiconductor research that's fundamental uh, research. So it's open, it's, it's published in the open, but yet it's not allowed. And, uh, and that's to protect the US scientific and technology advantage, I guess. Uh, and you even see sanctions now, not, uh, not the generalized terms of sanctions like interruptions uh, between CERN and Russian scientists, but you see actual sanctions from the Office of Foreign Assets Control against universities who are doing fundamental research, so it's it's all open access. I mean, it's open uh, to the public, right? Uh, but yet, it's on sensitive uh, topics. Uh, for instance, uh, well, Skoltech uh, is one of those universities, uh, and so this is. It seems we we're moving in some kind of general direction. Where I, I I don't remember this in the past, where there's it's not classified, but there's a whole body of fundamental research which should be open, which has many other advantages uh, for meeting uh, sustainable development goals, et cetera, but it also can have a military application in the long term. And uh, you're seeing some clamping down on those activities and some legal exposure uh, that's not uh, very welcome to US scientists or other scientists uh, dealing with uh, scientists from other countries on those topics. Uh, uh, Laura, are you uh, familiar? I mean, I think I- Oh yeah, I- I the Chinese scientist. I actually moderated okay. the webinar for the National Academy of Engineering last week, where Gang Chen and Xiao Xingji were were the speakers. And uh, um, I, you know, I, I think Xiao Xing had listed twenty six Chinese American scientists that were charged, and almost all of them were dropped. And you know, so it's a very dangerous area right now. Um, what I would like to see happen, and I've been saying this for years, ever since, because I've known Xiaoxing for decades and decades. Um, it, the FBI doesn't really know when they arrest these people, when they charge these people. They're checking boxes. And we do have ability to help educate them. So, for instance, the National Academy mm -hmm. of Sciences has something called ISTEG, ISTEG. And I'm a member, and I get these emails, and I can either answer or not if I know something about it. And before you actually have, as any great university or any great institution knows, whether it has to do with fraud or, or harassment or whatever, the, before you have a full-blown investigation, you have an inquiry to determine if there's grounds for an investigation. And I would like to see the, the FBI in the United States do more of this not bring in a membership society because the APS has no business doing that, but to bring in an academy member, you know, from engineering or medicine and say, is this worth worrying about? 
And then the other thing is that some of these things are just errors. So, so visible people like me are just always in a panic because if, if there's one little error, I'm going to lose my job, right? And so yeah. in, in some of these cases, if you just said, you know, you forgot to list this, why don't you go back and list it now instead of threatening them with years in jail? So, um, so there, there is this giant, you know, and so I would like for the academies, et cetera, to sit down with our, with, with the FBI and DOJ and other people and just help educate them. So there is, there, there are spies. We do have to worry about that. We do have to be mm-hmm. vigilant. Um, I'm not going to go to Russia or, 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 or China with my laptop anymore. And there's very few countries who I would do that with. So we're aware of that, but we also need to maintain our international collaboration so vital to approach the problems of the 21st century. I would like to see the US free mm-hmm. the scientists so they can freely interact with Chinese scientists. It's vital. And so, and Iranian, which is totally impossible right now for, for many US universities. Um, uh, so we're, we're losing out on a lot of that. So yeah, I don't know what to do next on this, but you bring up some very, very important topics, Joe. Thank you. I, I am sorry okay, to interrupt, thanks, thanks but I have, I have to leave. I'm very sad about that, but I had a previous commitment. Very interesting. And thanks again for the invitation. And sorry, Monica, that I missed your talk, your presentation. Oh, Thank you. So, very much. Bye, Selena. Bye, Selena. Bye-bye. And I guess Bye, that, uh, the audience is welcome to email you uh, if it's... Uh, yes, sure. Yes. Have you have more questions. Thanks a lot, yes. Thank you. Indeed, and, and before we, we uh, look at uh, the presentation, maybe also for Monica, there are just a few more questions as well in the question and answer box where, so first of so, uh, the congratulations as well from Valentin Novozat, which I think greatly appreciated as well this uh, effort. So, and showing as well what IUPAP can do and the involvement as well, including the help in Ukraine. So I think it's an important part. And as well, we have some com- uh, questions as well from Horacio Fernandez, who were asking as well your opinion, Laura. So looking at uh, the, the Free academy, academy to allow Russian students to apply using the same declaration statement. So I guess you partially already answered it, but maybe a live answer for Horacio. Um. The, the question, no, the, the question was that about the statement, the statement? About the, the same declaration statement, I guess, from the IUPA, and this is already what you are doing, isn't it? Yeah, so I just brought this up because, you know, some people just will not work with Russians. You know, it's all over the map. And do we blindly just say science diplomacy has to win? You know, but but so IUPAP statement I thought was brilliant, which was just say that your affiliation is IUPAP, and now once you get into the conference, you can have Chernogolovka all over them, all over your slides. But um, but it, it's just a gentle way to say that we understand that there is a problem here and science diplomacy has changed. I you know so Michelle, thank you for <laughs> all the work that you did on this and and Monica. But- yeah, the, the, the declaration was mainly intended for um, uh, allow to allow these people to attend conferences, uh, IUPAP sponsored conferences, um, while you know. Ma- in in some uh, in some cases, uh, the scientists were not allowed to use their uh, original affiliation, and so we proposed this option as a way to overcome this difficulty. I mean, to sign this declaration not as a, as a true I mean, administrative affiliation, but as a way of uh, uh, allowing them uh, to to be part of the community and participate in these conferences. Uh, I don't know whether this uh, could be extended to students. I mean, students is a different is a different matter. But for students attending conferences, yes. And and maybe, Monica, if you could uh, quantify, or maybe Michelle as well, were there many scientists who were able to use uh, this capacity as well? You are muted, Michelle. Michelle, you are muted. The most spectacular uh, example is the International Nuclear Physics Conference in Cape Town, you know that there is a very strong uh, nuclear physics community 
in, uh, in Russia. There is even a, also an international organization in Dubna, which is in Russia, uh, connecting uh, former uh, uh, USSR countries for nuclear physics. So the conference was in, in Cape Town, uh, and we proposed this IUPAP affiliation. And finally, they decided that all people will attend uh, the uh, Cape, Cape Town International Nuclear Physics Conference with an IUPAP uh, uh, affiliation, celebrating the 100th anniversary of IUPAP and allowing people to come there. Uh, they all signed the, the declaration that um, Laura showed, uh, uh, showed that uh, they are not actively supporting the war and so on. So no nationality, only science to prevail. That's yes. wonderful. Uh, what... And even the director of GINR, uh, the uh, son of, uh, of USSR, was wearing uh, this uh, IUPAP affiliation. So this was the most famous case. And for other conferences, there were speci some specific cases where uh, people attended with uh, an IUPAP affiliation. Some refused because it was too risky for them. Uh, but okay, this is, uh, this is, uh, uh, I think it functioned uh, rather, rather oh, well. No, no. The spirit of, of yeah. what Laura said. Mm, brilliant. Brilliant. And we had as well another suggestion by uh, Agneri uh, Obadik, who was speaking about the Fulbright as well, the foreign student program. So could it be as well an avenue concerning the US, Laura? For the Fulbright program. I guess that, uh, yeah, it should. I yeah, um, I think this is all pretty new. I don't really have an answer for that. And I'm feeling guilty about taking time away from Monica right now. So, <laughs> so, so why don't we keep other questions on this later? Because I really, uh, Monica did the most amazing job of no. the secondary. Oh my God. And so, so I'm, I'm sort of stepping in here where I shouldn't, but I always do that. And I would love to hear Monica's presentation. <laughs> Me too. Oh, we, we all want it's going to be very brief it's going to be very brief so let me let me share my screen and we say we we keep the best for the end then monica no no as uh we had um okay so um <clears throat> uh, as you heard uh, uh this year was uh, the iupap 100th anniversary and i was given the task of uh, organizing uh, celebrations uh, to uh, to mark this event and this was not an easy task because we have we are very few people uh, we have limited resources and uh, there was covid in between so um, all the plans that we had made to uh, go here and there, et cetera, in reality, were completely, you know, were, were the, uh, nothing of what we had uh, initially anticipated could could be done, and uh, and, uh, and and we hadn't we didn't meet for for two years so um the, the whole the whole process was extremely complicated but um, in any event uh, uh <clears throat> We uh, organized uh, several initiatives, and I think the most important, the most significant was uh, the Centenary Symposium that I will mention in a second. Then um, the IUPA 100 History Project uh, is also uh, a, nice, a nice initiative. Uh, that I will very briefly illustrate. And then uh, we organized a photo contest and then satellite events elsewhere in the world because uh, IUPAP is a world organization. And, and so uh, we wanted to, uh, to, to mark uh, somehow this, this concept. As I said, all organized with very limited resources, uh, people and money and a lot of good uh, will. So the Centenary Symposium took place uh, uh, at ICTP in Trieste uh, over three days uh, in July of 2022. Uh, some people managed to come and, and many of them connected, uh, many of them connected online. And uh, um, the, 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 the meeting, I mean, how uh, do we organize a meeting to mark uh, the, century of, the centenary of IUPAP? Um, well, uh, so it could not be a, a normal uh, physics conference. On the other hand, it has to be a conference on physics as well. So uh, what we um, organized uh, was something which is schematically illustrated in this slide. So we wanted to have, uh, we, um, we had some uh, segments on the IUPAP history. 
then we uh, organized a remote connection with a very large uh, uh, IUPAP uh, sponsored Type A conference, which Type A means, type a means uh, with a lot of participants of the order of a thousand participants. Uh, and, and this one in particular was in Italy, uh, in Bologna. Uh, during this event, we welcomed Ukraine as a new IUPAP member. And, uh, um, and, and so uh, um, Anatoly Zagorodny, uh, the president of the National Academy of Science, Ukrainian National Academy of Science gave a speech um, <clears throat> for this event. And uh, we used uh, an expedite procedure to welcome Ukraine uh, in uh, the um, IUPAP community. And, uh, and also we publicized uh, uh, during this occasion, uh, all these initiatives that IUPAP took uh, to facilitate uh, uh, um, in this moment of crisis and in this moment of uh, you know, difficult com communication, uh, we wanted to, set, to send a message that we are open. We are open to all those scientists who uh, complied or who, uh, to the principles of, uh, of open science and of, uh, of science for peace. And uh, so we wanted to give a strong message in, in, this, in this direction. And uh, all these, uh, um, 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 okay, um, uh, Laura has already uh, spoken uh, about that, all these uh, IUPAP initiatives, which I thought was, was were, were quite forceful. Then we had a keynote talk by uh, uh, Taki Kajita, who is uh, um, uh, involved in the in one of the Europa Commission on the new, so Nobel Prize in Physics on neutrino physics, so which was for our community, for the Europa community, and for the ICEP community in in Bologna. Then, then we had a special talk, uh, uh, which uh, we also thought. Uh, um, uh, was important given the, the current circumstances on uh, the increasing peril from nuclear arms and how physicists can help uh, reduce this threat. And, and so we had a talk by Stuart Prager from the Physicist Coalition for Nuclear Threat Reduction, which is a, um, a, an initiative uh, sponsored and, uh, by the APS uh, to uh, create uh, uh, awareness in the physicist community about these problems, create advocacy, uh, get people involved uh, in, uh, in, uh, in reducing the threat. And then we had uh, panels uh, on the various IUPAP emission statements. So so you, you already heard uh, from Silvina. Um, so uh, an important thing is women and underrepresented groups. So it was a discussion panel on that, a discussion panel uh, on science advising policy, not only with Laura, but with also Giorgio Parisi, for example, who is uh, certainly playing a big role in Italy uh, uh, advising policy. Um, there was um, um, the chief uh, uh, advisor to the Australian uh, government, and, uh, uh, and and also there was a, a scientist who has a big role in uh, advising the Tunisia uh, government, uh, who also participated in the same panel. Then uh, we had a panel on early career and their and their problems and difficulties, how we can address them a panel on physics for development and a panel, panel on physics education. So these are the themes that we try to develop within, uh, within the uh, symposium. And then we try to address uh, 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 regional um, problems and regional um, achievements uh, uh, and expectations from IUPAP. So th the question was, what can IUPAP do uh, for the specific region? And, and so we had a panel discussing uh, problems and, and achievements in Latin America, and then Asia and Pacific, which is a very diverse, uh, um, a very diverse uh, um, a regional uh, um, Group of of nations uh, are comprised in, in in that in that category, and then Africa, Middle East. Then we had uh, uh, four prestigious keynote speakers, including Kajita that I just mentioned, and then we had the presentations by early career uh, award winners, IUPAP award winners, um, who gave you know a brief talk on their research, and this was excellent, excellent talks, which uh, you know make us be very optimistic about the future of, of physics. And, and science. And then we had uh, um, two thematic presentations of why it is important to be a member and focus on life out, 
outside of academia, so in particular uh, the, the world of uh, of industry, which absorbs uh, the largest part of of the of the of the physics community af after university. So. Um, um, Oh, the keynote speakers were brilliant, and uh, so we had, sorry, we had uh, Bill Phillips talking about the modern metric system. Uh, so uh, this is something on which uh, the IUPAP Commission C2 uh, had a big, big influence on defining this modern metric system. Then we had Donna Strickland for C17, another Nobel Prize, uh, talking about optics and laser physics. And then, as I mentioned, uh, Kajita talking about neutrino physics physics in the last 100 years. And then finally, we had Tim Palmer talking about the um, about climate change. And in particular, uh, um, he spoke about the need of uh, uh, establishing a CERN-like entity also for, for climate change. So put it together, uh, the most brilliant minds uh, in in the field and a lot of uh, computational power to be able to address uh, some of the challenges uh, of uh, of uh, of this complicated problem and uh, okay uh, just very briefly uh, on the history project, uh, it, what clearly emerged uh, during the symposium is that uh, from the early days, sorry for the typo, of the union, there was an idea of inclusiveness, in the, it, of course, in the context of the time and desire to be truly international. And so this is really reflected all along the history, history of the union. And then... Um, uh, what we did uh, was uh, we decided to um, digitize uh, uh, you know, huge archives, uh, documents uh, spread all over the world uh, about IUPAP. So all these were digitized. And then uh, um, um, historians, again, from uh, all over the world uh, got together and uh, to address uh, several uh, research topics, such as, for example, the role of IUPAP in the development of physics or the connection between science and diplomacy uh, along the years or the interna internationalization of physics through the 20th century or the relationship between basic and applied physics and all this material uh, was discussed in a, in a symposium that took place uh, very recently in San Sebastian and will be put to, will be uh, put together in a volume that is going to be uh, that is going to be um, published next year. And then we had a photo context, uh, so we thought it, it was nice to have art and, 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 and physics uh, put together, and so um, the entries were classified in two categories, and the results are available, are available at the link given below, but I thought it would be nice to show you some of these beautiful pictures, uh, uh, such as, for example, this one, uh, uh, showing the uh, which is titled "Chasing Ghost Particles at the South Pole" about the ice cube uh, uh, experiment, uh, which won the first prize, or this one that uh, uh, shows a surface tension. Uh, on, you know, this simple object uh, um, the, is uh, used to create a, a, a very nice vis visual effect, or uh, this one, for example, on a foldoscope, which is a revolutionary microscope, uh, which is also a very, very nice, very nice uh, picture. And then uh, IUPAP is international, so uh, there are several events which have been organized all over the world. Uh, here is a list uh, of uh, some of the events. Um, um, which took place in 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 various places or are planned uh, pl will will take place in in various places. But so you go from Africa to to Spain to to Asia and uh, and uh, all these events are going to mark uh, the important the importance on the union uh, for the global commun physics community. Some messages and lessons that we have learned. Uh, I think that this, the, the Centenary Symposium was um, a, a very important network event, and uh, I think it gave a lot of momentum uh, to several initiatives. And uh, I think it did underline the important role that IUPAP has had and continues to have to bring people together 
despite political conflict. And I think the um, uh, Ukrainian and Russian uh, case uh, that we have uh, um, discussed already is a, an important example of the usefulness uh, that uh, the Union can play in this respect. And uh, so, so this role, uh, important role, is manifest in facilities, projects, and regional networks supported by the Union worldwide. Uh, there, ha there are some of the initiatives that uh, UPAP has taken across, uh, along the years, uh, which have had a, a huge impact. Uh, for example, what Silvina mentioned, uh, the initiative to address the gender gap in physics, uh, in particular through the actions of the working group on women physics was extremely important for the creation of a very effective network for example, in Latin America, but also elsewhere. I should say that uh, um, uh, through the symposium and the activities related to the symposium, countries, um, for example, in the, uh, in the East uh, Asia um, uh, part of the world really got together and developed a program of actions together. So countries going from uh, Japan, you know, very developed countries such as Japan to, to China, to Vietnam, Vietnam, uh, to India, those countries established a very clear, uh, very important network and uh, they created their own IUPAP website to be able to create events, regional events um, for, for countries in that particular, in that particular region. Um, so uh, the symposium was also a way to uh, establish important links with the community of students and early career physicists. For example, as already mentioned, the International Association of Physics Students. Um, the uh, talks that we had on industry, climate change, and policy related all highlighted the various roles that physicists have and the need for IUPA to support these physicists and activities. And uh, it is essential that physicists continue to engage in climate change work and also in national and international policy. And this is all I have to say. Thank you. So perfect, perfect ending as well. And to recall uh, this importance for the sustainability aspect of the environmental aspect and uh, the climate change and what science and physicists can do with this respect. So essential, certainly. So do we have um, so specific questions? Uh, um, we can also recall that the satellite event that you were recording, I think it's fundamental to involve and engage, engage locally as well, more physicists to gather as well. So because this is an opportunity for them to be able to be locally then gathering around those thematic and then to communicate with the rest of the world. And All these initiatives are available, are described on the IUPAP uh, web, web pages. So if you want more information on those, uh, there are all these links that I've taken from the web webpages. And, and I just put as well the link for the, the page uh, on the chat, uh, so for our audience. And as well in a similar way, so to recall that the APS also is doing some kind of satellite event now, so maybe as well engage and inspire by uh, what you've been doing with the, the IOPAP. So I think it's good for, we had already one session last year and then in March and April next year. So we'll have something as well similar in different continents. Yeah, there will be a dedicated session uh, during the APS meeting in Las Vegas that we will, uh, uh, that we are organizing. Exactly, that is perfect. Then. And we have indeed, so the session, so that's uh, one of the, the special session that we have uh, in March, which will be in person beyond the satellite that will be a bit everywhere, but we could use as well a possibility to uh, stream those sessions. So we can choose this. And this is going to be so in, uh, uh, so on the, on the Thursday, 7th of March. So let's stay tuned as well with this aspect. And together as well, there is uh, that week also the next day, a special session as well for large scale scientific facilities and diplomacy. So I think those two sessions will be very interesting as well for our community to recall. So thank you very much for all this list. And indeed, there is a lot of uh, the recording as well that in the web page uh, we can find for the special event that you were listing, Monica, because this is like gathering all the material for a sustainable world. Mm.
uh, by the way, by the way, Laura, uh, the paper, uh, physics paper publication uh, at CERN from the LSE community is still suspended. Uh, and we are still discussing a common policy on how to, to move forward. Oh, so, so I, I heard so, you were just listing a, um, affiliate that you weren't listing authors. So, so what is going well? There's well at the moment the papers are still just posted on the archive. They're not published, and there's going to be a vote uh, by the collaborations, which is imminent uh, to decide the policy. And there are a couple of proposals um, that are going to be voted. So uh, this is still suspended. So um, it is oh. it is an issue. Th thank you for that information. I didn't know. And could it be some action from the different national academy of science or physical society together for, um, I mean, together? Well, I mean, you, the, the thing is that uh, um, we, we would like to have a common approach and uh, not uh, to have a collaboration going in one direction or in another in another direction. So the, the idea was to try to define a common CERN approach to the problem. And uh, this demands, uh, you know, consensus on, on a proposal. And uh, so there are a couple of proposals on the plate which are going to be voted. But uh, as, as Laura said, uh, this is not uh, an, easy, uh, an easy thing to achieve because uh, some countries are extremely, some people are very rigid in, uh, you know, in, uh, in what uh, they, they're willing to accept. Mm -hmm. So, um, IUPAP's attitude has been uh, quite quite different. Uh, uh, IUPAP's attitude has been to to keep uh, the the door the doors always open, which is also a certain certain attitude, by the way. But the collaborations, um, okay, have not yet uh, established uh, uh, well, a, a common policy. O open with some hoops, right? That's what I thought was so brilliant. And you know, and if, if I was a Russian scientist. I'm not sure I would have the courage to sign something like that, especially if I had small kids at home or something. So it what it's not completely open. It's it's a, an important step on the new world of science diplomacy in the middle of a hot war. That's right. So we also came up with a you know statement in support of Iranian women, of course, and uh, um, and. But I think this this uh, Ukrainian and Russia thing is is you know the action on which we were really effective because we managed to have an impact and to uh, to solve um, you know problems for for a certain number of people. So I think that was uh, a very good uh, very good initiative. And also, as you mentioned, we accepted uh, Ukraine as a new member for yes. uh, waiving the waiving the fee. Uh, by the way, uh, so as Laura mentioned, we are still in IUPAP. Uh, Russia is a member of IUPAP. Iran is a member of IUPAP. Uh, and Ukraine is also a member of IUPAP. So we are uh, opening the doors, provided that people are not acting uh, to, to uh, supporting the war. Yeah, we are opening the, the doors to individuals. Yeah. Right. Well said. Wonderful engagement. Who are aligned with our values, OK, obviously. Yeah, those value, yeah, I think this is what we have to maybe end on, but this is what will come back as well in March, because I think that those two sessions that I mentioned, they will be as well a representation from CERN by uh, Alizé Rabinovici, so I think it would be as well a good question there, like, uh, and, and hopefully by then we will have the possibility as well to know that these different papers have been um, granted the right as well to be published fundamental. Common, uh, yeah, capacity. So thank you so much, Monica. There would be so many yeah. things to to elaborate and to to think uh, on those lines. So we have to stay active for sure in uh, all these uh, prospects. So perseverance is number one. So and then like uh, believing but acting. I think activism is uh, an important part. So and I will uh, just then finish by uh, uh, so sharing my screen and. Uh, uh, unless so Joe has as well some command that you want to share. No, I just turned my camera on. I, but I, I would like to say thank you, Christine, for putting this together. It's really, it's really very helpful uh, yeah. for it's what we're trying to do all over the world. So inspiring. The the eye of the FIPA, you know, the international aspect is something that 
we all resonate with. So this is why I like as well with the IUPAP and what uh, Michelle and, and uh, all of you so have been able to show. So it's fundamental and important. So we, we try to look indeed uh, when, uh, as it was built at the beginning, to look at supporting with the Middle East, uh, the SESAMI and the different light source. So this is why Fonsense will have some more example next month with uh, Katarina Sobiskari representing as well. So the Alba light source uh, and to see how the sustainability as well in science has been achieved. So thanks to different activities so that they have been committed with. So this is the Thursday, uh, 15 of December and that's gonna be the last session so of, uh, of the year of this uh, international year of uh, basic science and uh, sustainable development. And I think it's really like the motto that we have here to resonate with those uh, capacity as well and to believe in science. So thank you so much, uh, Michelle, Monica, Laura, and Sylvana, and, and Joe, so for inspiring and, and giving possibility as well for all of that. Thank United you very much. For having a, and using another <laughs> motto. Thank so you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. And thank see you, you soon. Hey, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.